Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. I've really been looking forward to this. My name is Ben Palmquist. My pronouns are he and they. I'm uh, joining you from Oakland today on Ohlone land. Um, and I'm super excited for this webinar, co-governing toward multiracial democracy. Race Forward and Partners for Dignity, to Re Dignity and Rights are pleased to be co-hosting this. And we have three fantastic speakers joining us today to talk about their work. Um, if you all could unmute yourselves just briefly and just say a, a very quick introduction, who you are and, and where you're from. Um, my name is Brooke Floyd. I'm from Jackson, Mississippi, she, her pronouns with People's Advocacy Institute. Hi, I'm Rosie Grant. I am here from Patterson, New Jersey from the Patterson Education Fund. I use she, her pronouns and I'm sitting on unseated Lene Lenape land today. Good afternoon, my name is Shafan Liu. I'm with the San Francisco based Chinese Progressive Association and I am currently on Ohlone land in Oakland, California. Thank you all so much for joining us. I've, it's just such a pleasure to have been learning from you um, in this documenting the work you've been doing and sharing it with people today. Um, and thank you too to our ASL interpreters. We have Amanda and Rivka on here today uh, interpreting for us. Um, and uh, we will be doing a Q&A session at the end of the panel. Um, so if folks in the audience sort of at any time during the discussion that you're coming up with questions, you can use the Q&A feature in Zoom to type in questions. And at the end, we'll spend some time answering as many of those as we can. Um, but to kick things off, um, I just wanted to give us a bit of background framing and then get out of the way and uh, make sure we can hear from our speakers. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about how this project came together between Race Forward and Partners for Dignity and Rights. So the movement capacity building team at Race Forward and, and us at Partners in Dignity and Rights do a lot of uh, direct support with grassroots groups on the ground all over the country who are organizing for economic and social rights and racial justice. And in 2020, we started conversation, you know, it's a very fraught moment. It continues to be a fraught moment in time, of course, trying to figure out, you know, what are the sort of collective demands that people are shaping on the ground around the country? How are they organizing for them? What are the needs that are there? And is there anything we can do to amplify that and help support the work? Um, and so we, as we were looking around and talking to people, a lot of common themes started emerging, really centered around questions of power. Um, so people were demanding community control, sovereignty, economic democracy, um, a lot of sort of themes about saying that, you know, we, the people need sort of where we are directly impacted by things need to have a say in actually how they're governed. Um, there's, you know, a really powerful vision, but I think a lot of also questions everybody has been working through that, that we don't have ready answers to. So what does real democracy look like? Not just in an abstract or empty way, but for all of us to hold meaningful collective power every day in our communities and workplaces. How do we have to shape democracy in a multiracial country whose politics and economy have always been shaped by racism and other oppressions? How do we combat the alienation of capitalism and neoliberal governance in which people are treated really as just passive consumers and are not accustomed to being members of organizations or really governing ourselves? Um, so as we've been trying to collectively, not just us, but everybody think through these questions, you know, we at Race Forward and partners are really drawing on and walking alongside many other people. And we hope that this webinar and the report we're putting out today um, helps expand the conversation about what democracy could be. Um, so we're hoping to break from harmful norms, right, that the public's role is really just to vote every two or four years and then sit back and let elected leaders run the show. And we hope to focus on a deeper meaning of democracy in which communities and workers really have the power to shape decisions in the workplace, in the healthcare system, in our schools, and in every sector of our lives. Um, there's real challenges. We'll, get, we'll hear about many of those today. Um, but, but among other things, I think a lot of organizers and folks are ambivalent about government, right? We have experiences of state violence, 
um, and other harms that government has actually been a party in. Um, but also when organizers and communities are trying to work with government in good faith, it often feels like folks are sort of shunted into tokenizing efforts like task forces or, or public hearings that really don't go anywhere. And it can be pretty demobilizing and counterproductive. Um, but I think as you're here today, we all feel that there's still a very essential role for co-governance. Um, we're up against real big challenges, right? Authoritarianism, white supremacy, human rights denials, precarity, climate collapse. Um, you know, and at the root of these really is all this uh, common theme in which the people who are directly impacted by different injustices and also who have a, the biggest stake in all of the systems in our society are systematically disempowered. So what co-governance offers is a chance to flip that on its head. Um, and I think it really builds on essential roles that both government and community groups have. Um, so government has powers and authority and funding and community groups and labor groups have, you know, membership who is rooted in communities directly impacted um, and can simply identify people's needs and speak for people in a way that government can't. Um, Co-governance isn't the cure-all. It has to be one of many strategies. We need electoral organizing. We need to build mass organizations. We need to build solidarity economy institutions. We need narrative power strategies and advocacy. But um, I think what I've been learning from Brooke and Rosie and Shasan and folks around the country and many of us are seeing is that it opens up some real opportunities. Co-governance can provide really powerful base building and leadership development opportunities for grassroots groups and help them lever up their power by leveraging resources and authority of government. It can help government really advance justice and meet its mandate to serve people in ways that it can't do on its own. Um, and hopefully, you know, by providing ways that we can work both inside and outside of government strategically at the same time, it can plant the seeds for some more deeper transformation and help us realize an actual, you know, multiracial democratic society. So um, the last thing I'm gonna share here are a couple of slides just before I kick things over to our speakers. So I wanted to first just offer a really brief introduction just to ground us in, or a definition rather, of what co-governance is. Different people use different terminology like collective governance or participatory governance and have slightly different definitions. So we're not trying to be doctrinaire, but just wanted to offer a definition to ground this conversation today. Co-governance is a collection of participatory models and practices in which government and communities work together through formal and informal structures to make collective policy decisions, co-create programs to meet community needs, and ensure those policies and programs are implemented effectively. And I'll just briefly share some of what is in this report out today. We'll share the link to this. Um, at its heart is really these three case studies you'll be hearing all about today. Um, so we have People's Assemblies in Jackson, Restorative Justice in Patterson, and worker-powered co-enforcement in San Francisco. Um, we also have a section sort of grounding the co-governance efforts today in historic struggles and looking in particular at the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and their inside-outside organizing. Uh, we have a landscape, and this is by no means extensive or all-inclusive, but um, wanted to sort of illustrate some of the breadth of co-governance efforts going on all over the country today. And so I'm really pleased to highlight and link to more information on a whole bunch of efforts beyond the folks you'll be hearing from today. And then lastly, uh, did our best to sort of pull out some lessons from all this work that's going ongoing around the country um, to share those. So I'm just gonna name these. I'm not gonna go into these because I think you'll hear these themes actually drawn out by our speakers through the rest of the conversation. Um, but some of the common lessons that have been emerging are that it's important to cultivate community capacity, build relationships between community and government, pursue inside-outside strategies, make co-governance enforceable, transform the culture of governance, and scale up and scale out co-governance much more broadly. 
So um, with that, I am very pleased to turn it over to our speakers. And Brooke, I'm going to begin with you. If you could just sort of give us an overview of our work. I know um, there's a lot happening in Jackson right now. And so <laughs> however you want to begin, but tell us sort of, you know, ground us in sort of what you're up against there, but also this really uh, powerful people's assembly model that, that you all have been building out. Thank you, Ben. Um, well, we are going through a lot. Um, we have been fighting a water crisis. Um, we have been fighting the state most recently. Um, and through all this, our people's assemblies have um, been a constant. They have been a way for um, our residents, our community members to access information, the correct information, um, and have access to government. Um, we also want it to be um, a place where everyone is welcome. Everyone's ideas are welcome. And it's not just a community meeting, another community meeting, another town hall. It is definitely a space where we come together and we discuss the issues, of course, but we also come up with solutions. And those solutions then once we work on them together, um, collectively, um, we take them, if possible, if, if that's what the solution becomes, we take it to the city um, and the mayor um, to enact into policy. And mm -hmm. right now, um, what we've been you know, dealing with since August 29th, um, when the flood happened, we have been you know supporting our community um, during a water crisis. I mean, People's Assembly is definitely about co-governance and, and getting our people involved in the electoral process. But at the same time, we have to support our people. And so we have, from the very beginning, you know, been in coalition with other organizations and providing water, um, providing food, making sure people have what they need um, when we didn't have water. And also then helping to lead marches and rallies um, centered um, to fight the state for the lack of funding towards our infrastructure that they have continued to do for the last 30 to 40 years because we are a predominantly black city and a progressive city. So we do that, but we also involve our community members and let them know what's going on. Um, and we try to make sure that at every step of the way that we are supporting our community members, one of the main reasons that people in any community don't become involved is because they don't have time and they don't see how it affects them on the day to day. You know, when I'm at work all day, when I got to, you know, run from school to daycare or, or pay these bills, you coming to my door telling me I need to vote is not it. And it it does not hit home and I, I, I really don't care. And so we make sure that every community um, engagement event, people's assembly function, whatever we have, we have food, we have child care, and then we also offer them support to get them involved in a way that they can tell us what is going on, what are their needs, what is going on with them. And then how can we collectively come together as a community and solve those issues? And I'll pause there for someone else to, to jump in. That's great, Brooke, thank you. We'll, we'll be hearing a lot more about that in a moment. Um, but Rosie, could you tell us a little bit about how you personally got involved in restorative justice work in Patterson and, and sort of the shape that, that that's taken over the years, what you've been able to accomplish? Sure, thank you. Uh, I, I wanna start a little bit before we started restorative practices in Patterson. Uh, we were participating in the Dignities in School uh, campaign around solutions, not suspension, and pulled the data on Patterson Public Schools to look at our suspension data and our attendance data. And we were surprised by what we saw. We pulled the data from the State of New Jersey Progress Report cards by going through each school's report and found that not only were kids being suspended at um, an unbelievable rate, uh, there were schools that had up to 70% of kids suspended. 
So we presented the data. I'll talk about resistance to the data later okay. and uh, started looking for solutions. Uh, we had an early policy win that the district said, okay, yeah, let's take a look at this. This is problematic. Uh, Linda went to a Dignity in Schools campaign. And Linda Reed is my colleague who heads up the Parent Education Organizing Council in Patterson and also is on the PEF staff. Linda went to a Dignities in Schools meeting and saw people um, demonstrate restorative practices and came home excited about it and said, you have to see that. So when we went to another meeting shortly thereafter, she said, you go to this and you have to see uh, restorative practices in action. And I did, and I thought it was a fantastic way um, to have people to begin to build those relationships that will get kids and keep kids coming to school and keep them in school once they get there. Uh, so we brought it back and, and slowly introduced it to the community. We did not start off, off with this concept of co-governance. And I had actually not heard of the term until Dignity in School and Race Forward um, approached us about doing this report. Uh, we just started with parents, with community members. Eventually we did it in a parent conference and people began to ask about restorative practices. And then we took it from there and built gradually. Okay. Thank you, Rosie. Um, and Shasan, um, happy to bring you into the conversation. Uh, I know the Chinese Progressive Association has a long, long history of doing great work in San Francisco. And in recent years, you've sort of really focused in on the restaurant industry and building out a model of uh, co-enforcement. Can you tell us sort of how you all found your way into that as, a, as an important front of struggle and, and what you've done over the years? Sure. So um, first of all, it's just an honor to be on this panel and taking on this topic that I'm sure there's a lot of folks on this call who have a lot to, and a lot of folks in the country who have a lot to say about this topic. Um, and it's an important one. Just a little context of CPA. We are uh, the Chinese Progressive Association in San Francisco. We just turned 50 years old. Um, we were born out of liberation struggles in the 60s and 70s and um, our inter intergenerational organization that is um, working to empower everyday Chinese immigrant working families to improve their lives and in their communities, um, make the kinds of changes that are needed to be able to thrive. Um, and we do some deep partnership and solidarity with other communities of color. Um, so that's just a little backdrop of who we are and the work that we do around workers' rights and um, uh, labor enforcement really came organically through our work with our members, you know, um, and seeing that the basic needs that people face living in overpriced, overcrowded housing and working in exploitative job conditions, that the quality of their lives and their work was very deeply connected. Um, and that the only way we could make inroads or changes to those working conditions, we believe was to organize and build power. Um, but to do so in these really difficult conditions people faced, uh, we really needed to leverage the public agencies that have control and you know, uh, responsibility to address those conditions. Um, so I wanted to actually share a quick story to illustrate this work because um, you know, I wanna talk about Adzan, who was a China, uh, Chinese immigrant um, mom who uh, met CPA almost 20 years ago in one of our very first labor cases, um, trying to enforce the brand, then brand new San Francisco minimum wage. Um, she was really afraid of being involved. Um, so she wasn't too active in that campaign, um, but experienced the benefits of, uh, you know, her coworkers and um, coming together, right, to uh, demand that they were paid uh, not only unpaid wages, but also the minimum wage. Um, and from that campaign, she got to know CPA and got involved in our programs, got organized into becoming, you know, an activist in the community around different issues um, over several years. Um, but then when we found out that at her new employer, um, the most expensive dim sum restaurant in town, uh, the uh, James Beard award-winning restaurant that she worked at uh, was also not paying her minimum wage, right? She, uh, having been at rallies and spoken at city hall and been involved in her many, many campaigns for the community was still reluctant to come forward and to say anything and to take action because of the legitimate fear of her livelihood and being the sole income for her household. And um, it took a lot of one-on-one -on -one organizing and persistence. And the fact that we had the partnership and support of 
um, actually not one, but two labor agencies, both the city and state labor agency, um, as well as other community partners, as well as organizing people around her. I mean, it took a lot to get, you know, um, then to decide to take that leap of faith and to get involved. And she eventually became a leader in that campaign, which eventually organized um, nearly 100 of her coworkers um, into a workplace campaign where they took direct actions. Um, they participated in the legal investigation um, and ultimately were able to come out of it with uh, winning a $4 million settlement for back wages owed to these workers for the wage theft that they had experienced. Um, but not only that, they were actually able to change the conditions in their workplace and win a whole set of agreements that moving forward, this very um, e exclusive and you know expen expensive restaurant would actually start treating its workers like the world-class institution that it purported itself to be. And um, for at then, that was the greatest, you know, um, difference was that that pride of knowing that she had made her workplace a more fair and a more um, uh, uh, a decent place to work. And so I share that story because I think it's so important to ground our conversations on governance. Like, um, you know, Rosie and Brooke have said, like, this is everyday people's real lives that we're talking about. And how do we? Um, we know these systems are not set up to allow our people to have a say in their conditions, to have any power over their lives. And it's all set up to, um, for folks just to keep their heads down and, and keep you know, um, hustling, right, to survive. And so the work that we're all doing as interventions, um, uh, you know, that, that's why in the labor front, it's so important to have these kinds of partnerships that we have built locally and statewide with enforcement agencies, because we need every tool possible to um, allow our folks a glimmer of hope that they can actually make tomorrow better than today. And that there is a possibility that their rights um, are not just disposable because they are immigrant workers or they don't speak English or they have not the transferable skills that this current economy is, is asking for, right? That, um, and, and so the work that we have done, um, you know, in co-governance has really been about uh, through the organizing, right? It's not like we didn't, like, just like uh, I think, Rosie said, we didn't come into saying we are going to build a co-governance model. We came into saying, how do we meet the people's needs and build power so our folks can live better tomorrow and the day after, right? And that work led us to saying we need to raise the minimum wage. That work led us to then saying, oh, shoot, the minimum wage is up, but that's not what's happening on the ground and people aren't actually having their rights enforced. So what do we do about enforcement? And then that led us to, oh, we need to make sure there's bilingual staff. And then that led us to, oh, the staff don't have enough power to enforce the laws. So we moved into it very organically, right? And um, that led us to create the, the nation's first um, publicly funded um, formal partnership between worker centers and community-based organizations on the ground with a labor agency to work together to ensure that um, people knew their rights and had access to support to exercise those rights. And that model, has then um, been a, become a way for us to do things that would not be possible if it was just the organizations on their own and if it was just the government on their own, right? In terms of being able to make inroads in uh, to be more proactive and strategic in investigations and in industries that are really, you know, underground economy industries that, um, you know, you need to have the relationships on the ground and the understanding on the ground to be able to make inroads to how you uh, address compliance in those areas. Um, and for um, our organizations to actually be able to have a, a level of legitimate formal role with the government, vis the government, right, that we're not just barking at the door always, but actually at the table, um, you know, and it's not uh, perfect, like I appreciate Ben's comments, there's no cure-all for anything, but this is an important tool that if we are serious about making things better for our communities, we have to figure out how to leverage more. Thank you, Shazan. Um, I want to, now I'm going to toss out a few questions and then we'll loop back to questions from the audience at the end. I um, mean, the first, Shazan was just speaking a bunch to it, but I want to invite any of you to weigh in. Um, is this theme of building power is, is really important, I know, in all of your work and is something that shows up as you're organizing with members and sort of and making sure to, you know, figure out how do we show up for people in their everyday lives. It shows up when you're sitting down with people who are in government. Um, I'm just curious to hear a little bit more about how do you think about building power and how do you uh, talk about that with folks and strategize around it? I don't mind jumping in. Uh, 
we believe that the people most affected by the problem need to be a part of the solution. And so that is why we started our restorative practices training in the community. Uh, so our very first training that we brought some folks in was for parents and community members at a uh, PEOC meeting. And we invited them to the table. Um, we actually had some educators come to that training as members of the community. Uh, so that's where we started. Uh, we then started getting requests from schools to train either their staff or portions of their staff. And, and we brought in someone to do another community training to which some school leaders came along with some community members. So gradually building at that training, we had um, the schools send, the two major high schools in Patterson sent their disciplinarians to that meeting. And, and they were first introduced to restorative practices. They were not all welcoming. Some went, oh, this will never work. And there's a story I might share later if we have some time um, about one success story of a person who was really resistant as we began implementing restorative practices. So it did not move into the schools until we had a good number of community members who were beginning to talk about and use the restorative practices and use the language. And then we reached out to some leaders because we, we had a campaign plan and we thought about who might resist and who might stop us in our tracks. So we reached out to those um, leaders and told them what we were doing and told them why and tried to get their buy-in. It wasn't until um, five or so years of implementation that we're now going to the point that it's going district-wide. However, we had enough relationships on the inside and people who thought this was a good thing that we could do it with the people who were ready and willing. Um, so that, as we look back at it, was building the power to do this work. Although again, here, we didn't start out to build power. Our, our ultimate goal is to get kids to stay in school, get the policies changed, to support that and to give them safe and welcoming learning spaces. And I'll um, add to that. I think in Jackson, one of our, uh, in earlier people's assemblies in 2019, um, the community came together and the major issues that were discussed over and over again were violence. Um, we had, you know, it, it, it was an uptick in every city, I think in America, but here, the concern was violence, education. I think uh, one of the other issues was maybe um, violent and housing, food insecurity. And so with the violence piece, the community members um, that were in those meetings and they were frequent, um, continued to discuss solutions. And so through those, we have, um, come together and develop our strong arms program in Jackson, which is a credible messenger program, which is doing great work and working with our youth court. I think that that is building power. It's in a South Jackson neighborhood that before they were there had lim limited resources and access and they work with our young folks. And then we have another program, Operation Good, which is a cure violence program. And they have I call them the souped up neighborhood watch, but um, they their first inaugural year, they had 214 days of no gun violence, like in a neighborhood that was having shootings every other day. So to me, that is building power, however small and however minute that is in that on that local level, block to block level, they are taking able to take back their families, their children, their neighborhood, their block. And then we were able to then convince the mayor to um, make an office of public safety based on those same community members requesting that. They wanted a, a community advisory board that would help oversee the police and then also help these programs become programs all over the city. 
And so the, um, the office was created last April. And so we are very excited about that. And that will also help to implement our common justice model program that we are very excited about bringing, which is a restorative transformative justice program. And so we have things that are being created from directly from um, our people's assemblies uh, that are directly from the community members, their ideas, um, the things that the solutions that they come up with to solve the issues they're going through. And then we also um, in 2019, our people's assemblies, and I know these are kind of dated, but COVID has put a damper on in-person things, and we are just now getting back into the swing of things. Um, in 2019, we were able to do our participatory budget, which we presented to the city, and that was given and taken into consideration in the city's budget for that fiscal year. And so that was something that was very, I think, empowering and powerful for the community members that were able to participate. And then since the water crisis began, we did a rally in March every two weeks in front of the governor's mansion. Now, um, that did not move our state to do what they should have done. What that did do, though, was get the media involved, get a nationwide and even worldwide um, focus on this city. And the federal government then stepped in and was like, what is going on? We have sent money to this city plenty of times through the state. And why is their infrastructure still like this? And so now we have federal investigations and the eyes are on our state for what has been going on. And if you've paid attention, the state of Mississippi is already in trouble for misusing um, TANF and government assistance for the very governor that's in office, the previous governor and multiple other politicians. But it just, our power is building. Um, I will say that and I can feel it. And, um, and I'll be quiet because I think there's some more questions where I get into more stuff about the state, but thank you. Uh, who else is like, Brooke, don't be quiet. Keep going. <laughs> I want to hear the rest of that. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll just jump in a real quick a um, couple of thoughts on the building power piece because I love this um, this thread and totally uh, really resonate with a lot of what Rosie and Brooke, um, you all have been saying. And just want to bring in, you know, uh, you know, when I think about building power for CPA, you know, I, I picture our members, right? I picture you know, our members who come in with their young children to CPA after work, you know, for, you know, knowing there's going to be food and there's going to be warm company and there's going to be a conversation in their own language. And also that they come because there's really very little other space, if any, anywhere where they can come not only learn about issues that are happening, talk about issues that are happening, share their feelings and concerns about what's going on, but also take make decisions about what they want to work on, how they want to weigh in on you know, this ballot measure or that other policy issue, right? And that they have agency to do that, right? And that's building power to me. It's about um, creating a space and a facilitating a process in which people tap into that power. And I, I liked, um, you know, Brooke, you said something about empowering and powerful. And I just appreciate that distinction because you know, like we need folks to be empowered in and stand in their agency and feel that sense of like what they are capable of. And that doesn't always mean that we win what we're fighting for, that we make the impact we're trying to have in, in the external, but it's part of building towards being able to win that external impact. And so, you know, just given the ways the rules of white supremacy and capitalism operate and like tell and grind all of us down, including our membership base, but all of us, right? Telling us every day that we're only worthy of what we produce and do, right? Um, and, and that we just have to keep our heads down, keep going like that is, that's what building power is, is, is breaking that rule and showing folks that they have, um, that we all have different, a different value and that we can, we can actually imagine and dare to dream for more for our communities. Um, and I think that co-governance playing into that is really about getting serious about this proposition that we we believe we can win. We believe we can do better. We believe that there is a different way and that we can actually change these systems. Um, and not just like, oh, we all want that, but we don't really think we can get there. You know, it's like, well, if we really want that, then what does it look like if we are gonna actually run things and, you know, um, exercise leadership? Um, 
And I just want to share one final, you know, reflection in terms of the trajectory of building power, right? And I've been at State CPA now for 16 and a half years. And when I started, you know, there had just been a big settlement in um, our, one of the wage theft cases. And there were some workers who were too afraid of being blacklisted to even come up to the office to collect their back paycheck. Like that's the level of fear and, um, and, and just this level of fear that people felt around um, speaking out about their rights. Uh, it was really taboo to talk about labor issues at all because it was considered that we were bringing shame upon the community, right? Um, and our own worker-led research showed that one in two Chinatown restaurant workers was receiving less than minimum wage. So conditions were hard. And, you know, and then we're like fighting with the agency, the labor agency over really basic stuff, like how they're calculating the minimum, the, the, the wages that are owed to workers and how they're um, so, and then flash to now, I think like things are still hard, We're gonna, you know, um, we still fight with our government partners over different things and how they approach stuff, but we've also made changes, right? We've, I think, normalized more in the community that wage theft is bad for everybody, right? We have been able to um, have a record over this, these years, a record of growing accomplishments in terms of what we've been able to um, do around addressing the crisis of, you know, um, workplace exploitation in terms of having um, actual justice achieved for groups of workers. Um, and we've been able to reach more people and develop a core of leaders and members who are the best messengers and are the best organizers of their of, of each other, right? To show that, you know, yes, it's scary and it's hard to step forward and to attempt to make things better for ourselves and our families, um, but I've done it, so can you, right? And that the power, the power that's there um, and that we've done that as part of building a larger ecosystem of um, worker rights and community-based organizations who are doing similar work um, across different, um, different parts of the city. Thank you all. That was really beautiful and powerful articulation of that. Um, I know though that as you know, as we're building power, as we're organizing our people, um, things don't always come easy, right? And there's a lot of actual resistance. Um, Brooke, I want to start with you. You know, you've been talking about the water crisis, and I know that white power holders in the state government are currently sort of making another power play in Jackson. I'm curious for you to talk about some of the resistance you've met at the state level and what you all are are doing around that. So. Um... <laughs> The state of Mississippi has uh, divested, disinvested, whatever you want to call it, in the city of Jackson um, consistently for about, I would say, 30 to 40 years. Um, in the 80s and 90s, we had a large, um, you know, white flight. I like to call it bougie black flight, whatever you want to say, where people were leaving the city, going to the suburbs. Um, and those of us that stayed, <laughs> And we were a blue dot in a red sea. And so, um, you know, mayor after mayor asked for state assistance and they were denied for the infrastructure repairs. And we live in a city state that has our ground shifts. It's Yazoo clay, it always has extreme heat. Um, and now we have, you know, climate change. We get extreme cold where we used to not have you know, we would have every seven years would be an ice storm or snow. And now every year we're having a cold weather of it. And so those extreme temperatures are making our pipes crack and burst even more and our roads tear up even more. And so those events coupled with the aging pipes that are beneath our city, our aging water plant and systems, um, they need to be repaired and they haven't been maintained. I mean, with a declining revenue, um, a declining tax base, you have all these things, it's the perfect storm. And so this past uh, August 29th, the flood, we had a, lots and lots of rain, uh, more than I've seen in, in the days that we've had without, I, I would say without a hurricane preceding it. Um, and flooding happened, um, of course, because we got national attention, the governor stepped in and act like he was going to help. And we have had a constant battle with this mayor and this governor um, because uh, Shokwe Lumumba, Shokwe Antar Lumumba, 
the younger Lumumba, um, is progressive and he speaks his mind and he is definitely secure in his blackness and does not apologize for it, nor should he. But because of that, um, he is seen as an issue and a problem. And he is blamed repeatedly for the infrastructure issues that have been going on since I can remember. Um, my grandmother, when I used to come and visit her in the early 80s, um, boiled her water because no one drinks the water out of the faucet. That is ingrained in you if you grow up here. So we have a state that doesn't fund education, so you don't know what's going on, that doesn't fund your water, so you can't drink the water. <laughs> we don't fund for food, so you have food insecurity that's rampant. So you have the three major things that help people survive, you know, food, water, education. And our state is last in all of those. And so these are all the things that you need to make it. And our state makes sure that our city that had, at the time, the largest public school system in the state, we had the most Black people population in the state. And so you are purposely making us fail. And so right now, they are at that state legislature trying to pass bills and pass laws that would take the $800 million that our mayor has secured to fix the water finally from federal government and through grants. They're trying to take control over the money so they can see and decide when we get to spend it. They are trying to expand a district that would allow the state Capitol Police that only answered to the governor to expand their reach. They are supposed to be in a small neighborhood called the Capital Improvement District that oversees where the governor's mansion is in the Capitol and a predominantly white neighborhood. They have killed eight people since May 2022. One of those people was one of my former students. I taught and ran a local nonprofit child um, children's program for 25 years before I, I came over to PAI. They murdered him on September 25th. And they have shot, I forget how many people have been shot as bystanders in their homes, okay? Now we all know that more police are never good for black and brown people or for poor people for that matter. And so they are trying to expand that district create a new court system that is overseen by the state within our city. So it would take away the power of the elected officials that we have voted for and they would have control. So we, right now, we have been sitting in the Capitol every day. We have held rallies on the Capitol steps. We have, you know, got our business owners that are in the city to sign on. We have gotten community members. We have held meeting after meeting. And it really feels like we are in the fight of our lives. Um, I am very concerned as a mama, as a teacher that has loved many babies in this city. Um, I am fearful because the Capitol Police shoots first and asks questions later. Um, and they are trying to take over our city and take away our rights here. And they have taken some people's lives. So, you know, we are, we are in a fight. Thank you, Brooke, for sharing that. It's, I mean, you're really on the front lines now. Is there, you have a national audience here. Are there ways um, people as individuals, as organizations can support you all on the ground there? Thank you all for giving uh, this space to speak and to share what's going on here. I just ask you to share, spread the word. Um, it is a scary time for, for those of us that live here, especially with young black children, young brown children, um, the fears. Yeah, thank you so much, Brooke, for yeah, your courage and sharing this and uh, not giving up. Um, Rosie, I'd wanna turn to you, you sort of on this theme of 
meeting resistance. I think fortunately, <laughs> Kings and Patterson have been a little more amenable to what you're doing, but you did, you said you had a story about a particular um, administrator who wasn't, and maybe initially wasn't the most <laughs> agreeable with what you were talking about. I'm curious to hear you. Sure, say. sure. But first my heart goes out to you, Brooke, and to the people in your community. It's, it's, um, we're talking about three different things here, but the underlying factor is systemic racism, um, regardless of the issue that we're going at right now. Um, so I can feel that, and we're certainly all suffering from that um, and impacted by that. Um, you just sound like you're at a ground zero there. Um, so thank you for your fight in this struggle. Uh, our resistance, um, not quite as, uh, um, dynamic, it, it was more subtle, but initially when we re released the data, the first response from folks inside the district was, your data is wrong. And we pushed back and said, but it's not our data, it's your data. And they're like, no, that's not our data. So we told them where we got it. The data that they gave to the state that they reported to the state is the data that we pulled. Um, so that was the first hurdle is having people really take a look at the data get past denial and own that it is our data and, and we need to do something about it. So that's, that's when we were invited, Linda and I, to sit on a district task force that looked at, um, looked at the disciplinary um, infractions, 27 ways that kids could get suspended for a level one infraction. Um, minor things like not looking a teacher in the eye, which we know in some cultures they're told not to look adults in the eyes and that could get a child suspended. Um, so the, the story I wanna share is when we had that first community training to which high school principals and administrators came, uh, there was one principal, Dr. Gerald Glisson, who has, we have lost him to COVID. Um, so uh, rest in peace, Dr. Glisson, and thank you for your work. Uh, he was resistant. He was disciplinarian. Kids who couldn't behave needed to not be there. They needed to be punished, et cetera. And was convinced by Linda to come check out the training, and he did. Um, we saw such a transformation that he went back to Eastside High School in Patterson, uh, created a peace room, uh, when we said we're taking people away for a one week intensive training, his team was there. He couldn't make it himself, but his team was there. And they turned the um, in-school suspension room into a peace room for restorative practices at, at Eastside High School. Uh, Eastside football team and the Englewood football team, uh, another local town, had a fight that got them suspended for the rest of the season from, from playing in the league. And Dr. Glisson said to his team, why don't we try to have a restorative session with the other team? And they did. The, the kids came together, they had the restorative session, talked out their differences, and it turned out that somebody said something in Spanish which was misinterpreted, and that's, that's why the fight broke out, because somebody thought they were being disrespected. However, um, they came out going, we actually have more in common than we have differences and made some friends with, with the enemy team. Um, I like sharing that story because here was a person who um, totally turned around once he was introduced to restorative practices, so much so that the district has now named it the Dr. Glisson Peace Room and it's no longer an ISS trailer. It's a room that has furniture that's in a circle, that has counseling areas for independent or group counseling, and kids can say, I need to go to the peace room. So it's, it's not punishment, it's a, a checkout place. Um, so that is the, the story about resistance that, that I wanted to share that turned out, uh, turned out to be someone who was, um, challenged to change uh, once, they, once they met uh, restorative practices. Uh, other resistance, we have not met much because we are working at first with the people who are willing. We have said, come to the table, come experience this. Uh, now, as we move forward into training every school, there are school teams 
um, that are then doing turnkey training inside the schools. And sometimes there are educators or administrator who come to the table with the arms folded and you already know they're not interested in hearing this. However, we push forward. And I think enough people, we've trained over 600 people at this point, um, enough people will keep doing this and it's infused. Uh, we, we are a little bit concerned as to whether there will be resistance as we change superintendents later this year. However, all three of our finalist candidates said something about climate and culture and restorative practices and making sure that young people are respected and welcomed and safe. Um, so it's a journey. Uh, we're not claiming success at this point, but we're happy to be on this journey with the folks in Patterson and Patterson Public Schools. Thank you, Rosie. Um, I wanna pivot to Shasan and ask you a little bit. I mean, I'm just so impressed with CPA's work over the years, but you've hardly been on this road alone. And I think one of the things that it seems like you've done very intentionally over time is build out different coalitions to sort of move together in the work. And I'm curious if you could just say a little bit um, about that for folks. Yeah, sure, but I can't really start that without first just also adding my like, my heart is still holding everything that Brooke shared earlier. And I don't, I'm, I'm sure that's probably the case for everyone on this call, just feeling very, um, the, the depth and the, um, the, just how, how sharp the contradictions are right now between, you know, the forces that want to, um, stop progress and the folks who are holding the arc of the universe towards its rightful direction. And I just feel so deeply, um, you know, I just, I'm just feeling it very deeply right now and just appreciate Brooke for your, your sharing and um, want to echo Ben's like, let's, you know, I would, I would love to know what are the ways that we can be supportive, you know, from afar um, uh, and, and help lift up what's happening in Jackson um, as, you know, a, a moment, a flashpoint moment, you know, in this country and in the fight that we are all carrying out, like Rosie said, at the local level, that's around the same root issues. Um, um, but it's, yeah, it, I, I we, we are in this, I feel like we're overall in this moment of such like the contradictions of how much injustice is built in and baked into our institutions and our laws and our systems and our mindset, right? That we are all striving to, to change and overcome right now. It's, um, it's, it's intense. So um, just really feel grateful for um, being able to be a witness and um, in this, just moment of being on this webinar with all of the invisible, <laughs> the 100 invisible people on this call that we can't see you, but we know you're there. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you, Brooke and um, and Rosie for also that inspiring, just uplifting story of, you know, just like the, the impact that our work makes on the one-to-one -one basis and being able to show what is possible um, and being able to shift, you know, um, from an, someone who's on the opposing side to becoming a, a believer and a supporter. Um, and I think it relates a lot to like this theme of coalition building, right? Because what we, um, you know, for CPA, we've always been very clear that yes, like the, the specific um, realities and conditions of our community as Chinese immigrant uh, working class people in the Bay Area in San Francisco um, doesn't always look the same as the specific conditions for undocumented day laborers in the Mission District in another part of the city or for you know, unemployed black workers you know, in, um, you know, in our city. Um, people don't have the same lived experiences and we have to respect that. Um, and we do respect that. And we also respect that where we are all going, we're trying to go somewhere that we can only get together. And that you know, the um, our coalitions, our partnerships are our safety. They're what keep us safe in times of threat and attack. They're what um, give us the possibility of reaching for more and reaching for more of what our, our, our communities actually deserve. And so, you know, for, for CPA, it's also just part of our historical DNA. We were inspired by the Black Panther Party. You know, that's how we started. And um, from the very get go, we were clear that you know multiracial solidarity um, was just part of who we are and how we how we roll as an organization. Um, and I want to share. There's like three ways that coalition building have been essential to our 
in the progress that we've been able to make, right, in um, in the world of like labor rights, and workers' rights, worker organizing, um, and the enforcement work. So. Um, the first area is building our own internal coalitions that are sometimes a cross-class coalition in the Chinese community, right? To say, um, actually it's in everybody's interest, whether or not you are a low-wage worker or the employer of a low-wage worker or a consumer at the restaurant where the low-wage worker works, right? That it's in all of our interest that workers have dignity, respect, safety, and well-being in their work. And um, we learned this the hard way. We didn't just, you know, we weren't so wise always, or I wasn't so wise always. I was leading a campaign early on where we ran into the opposition, um, the employer organizing the community to um, oppose our campaign. And that was, that was when we realized like, oh, shoot, we can't just focus on the workers and like the fight with the boss. We have to actually think about the surround, right? And how do we make sure that the surrounding um, community and other leaders and people who are, um, you know, respected in the community actually understand what we're doing and, and also shift their mindset. So that was a really important area of work for us. Um, the second um, area of work is around having the external political alliances to support the like partnership with government, which has a lot of limitations, right? When you're like working with the government and sometimes, and we have funding relationship and there's just, um, you know, limitations, right? To that relationship um, that we needed to have space outside of that formal government partnership to do our advocacy and to build our agenda and make sure that we were um, keeping the pressure on for that partnership to be successful, right? Because like for us, the co-governance is really about a, a, the, the, progressive cycle, right? It's not like the, the, the vicious cycle of things going backwards, but the progressive cycle of things moving forward that we demand better rights. We de demand more for our people. We win and then we have to enforce, implement, make it real. And that creates the grounds for us to then demand more, right? And we have to keep that, we want to keep that cycle going. And if we let up that pressure from the outside, the ability for us to move the inside partnerships, you know, also decreases. Uh, and then I'll just lastly name that, you know, the electoral alliances that we've been part of um, in San Francisco has been about uh, also understanding that, you know, on a broader political level, we need to make our communities um, more visible and understood in the political calculation to change the political calculation, right? Where, oh, you unlikely voters, you infrequent voters, you non-voters, like you don't really matter to the political calculation in, you know, these elections, right? And so CPA doing voter engagement work on our own is one thing, but doing it as part of a multiracial coalition with Black, Brown, you know, and other communities of color to create a new political poll in the city that, that lines up you know, independent labor unions and progressive forces and people of color and making our unlikely voters more likely voters, right? Increasing that propensity and through the kind of deep engagement that can only happen if you're actually organizing 365 days a year and not just on election day. And I'll just leave it at that. I know we're running close on time. That's great. Thank you, Shasta. Um, I want to turn now to some questions from our audience members that folks have been submitting. And the first one is for anyone who wants to jump in. Um, can you share how you educate decision makers and government staff about what community organizing and power building is and why it's so critical to changing the systems that perpetuates inequities and how or why they should support co-governance? Um, I think the conversations that I've had with government stakeholders, um, so there, there's kind of two sides to this. The first would be, there's the side of, you know, the Mississippi um, elect, electeds or, or those that are, those politicians that are not going to move regardless. And they're probably racist. And, you know, I, I don't care whether they align with me or not or whatever. I, I really don't even want to be in the room with them. And then you have others that probably got into, you know, politics to, to help, okay? But then are in there and for whatever reason are maybe doing their own personal agenda or an agenda that a party and um, other elected officials have gotten them 
to to do. And so the first thing that I have usually tried to, you know, express is, you know, when you're an elected official, you work for us. You you that's it. You know, we we put even if I did not vote for you, you still work for those it, the, their favorite word is constituents. Okay. Well, I am your constituent. These are the things that, you know, the community members that have been, you know, we have, let's say in this area, we have 2000 community members that are against this. And so they are calling your office repeatedly because they have an issue with this, wh whatever the, the issue may be. And I think a lot of those conversations are usually pleasant because I'm coming to them with an issue and you are the person that I know has the expertise to help solve this. Um, and then there's the other thing that Mississippi moves when it's shamed to move. We, we moved in the civil rights movement because we were shamed nationally, not because other states are better, but because Mississippi looks so bad. So it's the same way with the water issue and everything else. The only reason all of a sudden now that we're getting movement and money is because we are being shamed. And that's why I was asking, you know, please share this information. Go, go look us up about the Capital Improvement District and them trying to expand this reach. Because when we are shamed, our government seems to pull back and kind of stop. And so that has been the the... I guess what what I've kind of gone to when dealing with our elected officials. Now, city officials are a little bit different, um, and and they they're more you know those are people I grew up with, their parents, their grandparents. So we're a, a small town, but we're a big city. But the 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 state officials, you know, you kind of have to move who who can you talk to that still appeals to the community, and who are the people that are just you know. It, you're never going to change their mind there. It, it doesn't matter. You can't, we're not human to them. So if I can't appeal to the humanity um, in my, if you can't appeal to the humanity, humanity in me, there's no point. Brooke, I learned a long time ago that all children can learn, but not all adults can learn. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's how we choose who to work with sometimes. Um, our our power building is through relationships. Uh, the organization is turning 40 years old this year, and we've, we've claimed the identity of being a constant in turmoil. It's, it's a volatile community. Uh, it's working with parents. Kids grow up, parents move on. So we have to constantly build and maintain these relationships. And over time, as I look at people who have served, served in elected office in Patterson and now even in the state of New Jersey, they have been on our board, on our staff, our volunteers. And so we have these relationships of people who believe in the organization and believe in the mission of the organization. And we will work with anyone where our agendas intersect. I don't care what you're doing with the rest of the 90% of your time, but if in that 20%, we can talk about children and family and improving student outcomes and circumstances, we will work with you as long as we put that agenda on the table and, and we stick to it. So I, I think we will say, I will say transparency and relationships is what gives us power. And of course, um, um, doing, doing what we say, being mission-centric, mission-focused, and always asking the question, what about the kids? Maybe I'll just add quickly that um, I love all of that. And I, I, I agree, like the first thing is just, you have to know who are, is your audience. I mean, there's such a range of who you're talking about when you say people in government. So making that assessment, mapping it out, who is more movable, who is less movable, thinking like an organizer, right? As if you were going to organize a, a community around an issue, you're trying to organize this agency or this government body. Do you have, you know, your leader? Do you have the folks that you could, you know, test out a little bit and who are more sympathetic? And then the tactics change for that, right? And I think in general though, 
government listens when there is um, a push for them to listen. So in general, it makes a difference to have something public that's creating external pressure to make your issue a priority. And if you haven't created that you know, crisis of some kind out there, it's much harder to get the opening for conversations to happen unless you just have someone who's like, yeah, ready to go. It's great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and this, here's another question. This may relate in part to that. I'm curious your thoughts. Um, so this is for anyone who wants to jump in. Um, what is the most effective way to combat tokenism and false representation when most people in the community are too scared to be involved publicly? We are having this right now, um, speaking out against the police. Um, people are scared to stand up, and I completely understand that. Um, I was apprehensive at first um, until it personally affected me. Um, Jalen Lewis was my, my former student, as I said. I grew up with his parents. His dad and I were best friends in elementary school and middle school. So it was, a uh, you know, it had to affect me personally. Um, I think that when people see a group, I, um, I think that somebody said that earlier, when people can be able to come in community and they see a well, partner or they see someone else there, they feel comfortable. And I think that is one thing that we are good at, at People's Advocacy Institute and through the People's Assemblies is making people feel comfortable because there's people there that we welcome everyone. And people are there and you say, oh, oh, hey, I see my neighbor or I see this person or this person. And so they're able to then feel empowered to have power. Um, it's a little bit different if you're standing out on that ledge by yourself and holding a sign saying, you know, I'm against whoever and you're the only one there. But when you, you have, you know, yesterday we had a rally out in front of the Capitol. Well, there were 50 people there and then more and more people came and more and more people came. And so it, we stood behind Jalen's mother and other people that had been affected. And so when you have somebody behind you that has your back, I think you're able to stand up. Um, and there are people that have said they were standing with us and then we're not. And so you just have to be careful. I think when you build coalitions with people, as said, you know, we can agree for this. We know that we're not aligned on everything. That's okay. But in this space, you will respect this agenda and this task and this mission. Um, and we have people right now that are for this killing these bills. They, however, are, you know, don't have a problem necessarily with the Capitol Police being in certain areas, but they don't want the state to decide that for the city of Jackson. And so they agree that all the bills should be killed. And so, you know, you have to be able to work with, with different groups of people that are not necessarily on the same level that you are with your, with your ideas. But if there's an issue, which we've had recently, or people have gone back and said something else, we come to them, you know, like, hey, it's been great. I don't think we uh, we're on the same, you know, thing, even in this mission. I don't think it's going to work out and we wish you well. And that's the end of it. That it's not like there's this big dramatic, oh, you know, get out of here. We don't have time for that because we have a mission, we have a cause, we're trying to save people. So that's irrelevant. Um, and you just move on. Yeah, I would just, um, I love that. I just want to add a, a thought around um, when you were talking about the folks who are directly impacted, um, where there's not really willingness yet for folks to step out and, and be involved, that you just have to invest the time in building those relationships and in starting slow and starting small. And it took, you know, many years for us to, like I said, we started off with people, I remember workers telling me, workers who had actually taken action in their own workplaces saying, don't go around talking about organizing workers in Chinatown, we're gonna get in big trouble. Just say, we'll do some education, like leave it there, you know? And um, and it took, it took multiple projects doing community-based research where we were able to give people some short-term, short-term part-time work to work on some, you know, 
serving workers and developing more legitimacy that way. Like it was just many, we had to move many fronts to sort of shift the both build leadership and relationships among you know workers themselves as well as make a slightly friendlier in, environment so it didn't feel like they were totally going out on their own if they were going to speak up but that maybe there's some some friendliness out there right that can support them we're in desperate times in in patterson and across the nation we have escalating gun violence um, escalating gang activity our young people are dying and they're more at risk when we push them out of schools with policies and cultures that don't make them feel welcome or feel safe. Um, so we're doing restorative and transformative practices to give our young people the strategies and the opportunities to build some relationships and to use their words before they turn to the weapon, You know, to have conversation, to have relationships, with each other, um, with the adults. Every, every child should have a caring adult inside the school and should feel safe when they walk into that building. Um, and so that's why it's restorative practice, not restorative justice, because the practice is to use this conversation model, uh, build relationships, and we do that 80% of the time in restorative practice. And then this prepares our young people then for when there is some kind of infraction or harm, um, they know how to have the conversation. They know what words to use. They know how to lean on those relationships. That's the justice piece when they start talking about the harm and how that harm can be repaired. So we're doing that along with looking at ACEs and um, trauma-informed care and healing-centered engagement to really focus on shifting the culture to protect our young people, to keep them in school and hope that they can grow up to be fully contributing citizens. Thanks, Rosie. Um, and a couple of people actually had a, a similar follow-up questions for you um, about sort of what is the, the variety of ways that discipline and just, restorative justice look across schools in the district. So could you say a little more about both what is the the what differentiates restorative or transformative justice from a more traditional model of school discipline and punishment? Um, and then also, do, is there a variation in in the restorative justice model that happens across schools as well? Sure, um, we we teach the basics, and then the schools make it into their own. So there are some things we teach that it comes from indigenous practices around the world. Um, it's a way of holding conversations. You must respect the talking piece. You must have the things that are in a centerpiece. Uh, we create agreements. Each group creates their own agreements. Each group um, creates their own values. So that will look different from place to place. Uh, in some places, they're starting with groups of students. Uh, in other places, they're doing it district-wide. So there are schools that decide Friday morning, everybody's having circle conversations and the kids are all in conversations. Um, we provide prompts. They sit in a circle, not around a table, open circle, they pass a talking piece. And the prompts begin with um, getting to know you, icebreaker kind of thing, just so that people begin to build those relationships. And then as they progress, they're, they're having some tougher conversations about circumstances, about, um, police brutality, about the things that are happening around them, about the trauma that they're facing in their schools, in their homes, in their communities. So it does look different in every school, but the basic premise is that they are building relationship, building understanding and building community. And then I mentioned before, the justice piece, when somebody causes harm, instead of a student immediately getting suspended, they have a conversation. They have a circle conversation. The people who are harmed and the people who caused the harm come together and talk about it so that kids are not just being sent home to be home for five days and coming back to repeat the behavior. They have opportunity to talk with their, their peers, know how it affected them. And then when they come back in, if they do get suspended because there are federal infractions that demand suspension, when they come back in, there, there's a re-entry circle um, that they talk about how things are gonna be different. And over time, we're starting to see the effects of this, less suspension, certainly less expulsions. 
and we're hoping eventually less fights and violence as as we roll this out. Thank you. Um, we have another question about, you know, in recent years, there's been some of this federal stimulus money that Congress has passed flowing towards localities. And have you been thinking about or do you see possibilities for um, try, trying to push for more co-governance around how that money is directed and spent, particularly in, in equitable ways? All so, the time. Go ahead. <laughs> All the time. Um, whenever there's funding coming through, uh, we are looking for the people who have the decision-making power and trying to find seats at those tables. Uh, we pushed our way in when New Jersey had to come up with their uh, extra accountability measures and got attendance to be one of those accountability measures. When we called them, they went, how did you get our names? We got it through the Dignity in Schools campaign and their partners who did some research and released the names of all the state leads for the, for the um, funding and the proposals. So yes, we're always looking for those opportunities. Uh, full service community schools in restorative practices in school funding. Um, and, and again, it comes back to where I started, that people closest to the problem must be a part of the solution. Otherwise the solutions won't stick. There are children and there are schools. We also were looking at the same things. Um, our state got the same money that other states got with violence prevention and intervention programs. I think out of the hundreds of thousands is, that they received, I think they only gave out maybe 20,000 or 30,000 um, of the ARPA money for those programs. And then our city got a total of 48 million um, directly from the federal government, but because um, our system failed um, and everyone was looking at them to spend that money to fix it. In fact, the state's direct words were spend your ARPA money. Um, and our water system bill was 1.4 billion in order to overhaul it and fix it. 47 million is like a drop in the bucket. So, um, you know, the the ARPA money for the city of Jackson was gone very quickly um, and had been designated out um, to groups. And we went and appealed and we got and they were like, yeah, we, we went to committee. Everyone was excited. And then we started getting hit with boil water notices left and right. And the system kept getting worse and worse and then complete failure on the 29th. Um, and so we're just looking for other ways of funding. Funding. There's always more funding out there. We were able to find grants, foundations to help fund this work. And then um, Wells Fargo gave money to the city. And that was how the Office of Public Safety was formed. And so, you know, we're just doing what we got to do to make sure these violence prevention and intervention programs get funded here, as well as the, um, the restorative and transformative justice programs get funded. Yeah, um, similarly, we had been tracking um, all the federal money and looking at what are the opportunities we have to uh, advocate for resources. I think a couple of things I would note. Um, uh, one is that overall for our sort of grassroots organizing groups, it can be more challenging to access federal money, right, because of just our size and experience. And so there are uh, a few different efforts out there um, from some of the national coalition spaces to support um, organizations who are trying to figure out how to tap into that money. So uh, maybe that's something we can share over resources later. Um, and then um, I wanted to share that CPA was part of forming a, a workers um, uh, a Bay Area Essential Workers Agenda, um, which was basically a platform that we surveyed uh, workers across the Bay Area around to try to create a North Star for where we wanted to see those federal monies um, uh, and, and overall recovery dollars, right, which have been overwhelmingly focused on how to save businesses, right, um, and talk about how do we actually talk about focusing on the future for working families um, and how we invest in the future for working families um, with those public funds. So I think there's a lot of room and, in, and a need for us all to be, you know, putting our stake in the, in the ground for these resources because otherwise they're just going to go and fill coffers that don't need to be filled. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and a couple other resources or at least organizations and spaces that are sort of, I think, providing some support to folks who may be interested in this are the Participatory Budgeting Project, and then they're anchoring a coalition called the called Democracy Beyond Elections, um, and both of their websites have some tools and info. Um, I wish I could listen to you all for hours longer, but unfortunately we're approaching the end of our time. I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions, um, but I want to close with just a final go around of just sort of um, any, any closing advice or sort of thoughts you want to leave people with? I mean, you know, we have organizers on this call. There's people from foundations, people from governments. So we have a mix of audiences. Um, but um, we're all moving forward in this work together. And I'm just sort of curious what, what's on your mind as you leave. I would just say that this work is hard. It's emotionally draining. It's mentally draining. And sometimes it's physically draining. Um, but I think at the end of the day, what keeps me motivated and what makes me get up each day is that I am doing this for the future, for the children, um, for the babies that have yet to be born and the ones that just got born. Um, but I think that I want it to be better for them. Um, I spent my life being a teacher and an educator and I want to make sure that this next generation has what they need. Um, and I will fight until my last breath to make sure that they do. My advice is yes and <laughs> self-care. Uh, we cannot take care of our children and our communities if we don't take care of ourselves. Uh, this work can easily lead to burnout emotional drain. Um, so it's it's tough work, it's hard work. I gave my secret away in this report because I said my mantra has been gentle pressure applied relentlessly. So yes, apply that pressure relentlessly, um, but do take time to take care of yourself. I really appreciate that. Um, and it's something that I think Personally, and also in you know our organization, we are really trying to see how do we make those shifts to be moving in a way that we can actually relentlessly hold that pace, right? And oftentimes we're moving at a pace that we're relentlessly moving at a pace that cannot actually be sustained. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, I want to just add in that there is a lot of messiness when it comes to co-governance work and work dealing with government, a lot of messiness, a lot of technicalities, a lot of annoying bureaucracy and lots of power dynamics. Like there's just things that not everyone, you know, is going to enjoy. And that probably most people are not going to enjoy dealing with, right? From coming from our, our perspective. But but and you know, there's a purpose to it. And um and there's also just a lot of different roles that are needed in our movement and in moving towards a multiracial democracy through cover co governance and power building and so i just want to say that you know along with the what keeps us what makes us sustainable in terms of our pace and our rest is also are we in the role that gives us life and joy you know and do we wake up every morning feeling that you know i can do this and i'm in the role and it may change right over time what what is the right role for me right now um, so I encourage everyone to tap into that joy. Yes, thank you all so, so much on behalf of myself and Partners for Dignity and Rights and Race Forward, not just for this webinar, but for doing the work and really sharing it. It's been um, a real pleasure documenting the work um, and then we really hope it's useful to other people. Um, so we're going to be posting this recording on YouTube uh, by this week or next week, and we'll share that link out with everyone. Um, Leah posted in the chat for folks links to everybody's websites um, and links to the full report where case studies of this incredible work in Jackson and Patterson and San Francisco has been written up in a lot of detail. Um, I wanna, again, just sort of um, appreciate you, Brooke, for coming on and um, in a real time of crisis and um, continuing the work there on the ground and taking time to share with the rest of us and wanna encourage folks to support People's Advocacy Institute and other groups in, in Jackson right now. So 
Um, much love to you and to everybody there. Um, and just personally, I think on top of everything you said about doing this work for other people, part of what keeps me going and inspires me is, is doing it in, in community with folks like you all. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you.